Amen. Amen. Thank you. The sanctity of life. Sanctity of life. What does that mean? What is that referencing to? It really comes down to the idea that the human life, all life, is sacred, holy, precious, valuable. And as I thought of this, especially as this being the day of sanctity of life, um, I wanted to go beyond, hopefully, just the unborn, championing for, you know, against a, a abortion, as we will talk about those things. But hopefully we can convey the idea of the value of all life, from young all the way to old. And I will say, I think we do a great job in this church of showing the value of life. And you can see that just by the great different ministries we have. Great children's services, great children's care, nursery, you know, Moana, youth group. We have many different ways of meeting the needs of the children. And obviously we talked about the pregnancy center and how we impact there. We also have a young adults ministry that meets, that helps and impacts those that are coming out of youth and into those 20 to 30 maybe even beyond stages of life. We also have the elder class that we have. We have Seniors Alive and just many different ways that we impact there. And then, of course, we have groups for men. We have group, groups for women. And so the value of life, I think, is well demonstrated in this church. And I think that's awesome to see. So I've been thinking about this day, this passage that I might preach for for about two or three weeks now. And I, let, me, let me express exactly how I came on. If you could see in your bulletin, Psalm 139 is going to be our passage. Let me ask this question. How many chapters would you say or would, do you know are, that are in the Bible? Anybody willing to throw out some numbers? Well, there's 66. There's 66 books in the Bible. I would ask even further... How many chapters <laughs> what, what, what do you think that there are in the Bible? <laughs> There's a lot. I had to Google it. I didn't count them. But there is 1,189 chapters in the Bible. And so as I was thinking about where to go on this great and important Sunday, uh, I, was, I had the pleasure two Fridays ago to take Mr. Booker uh, to one of his appointments. And in the waiting room, we were able to talk. And so I was asking about his Bible reading and, and what that looked like for him, especially at this point in his life. And, and he was telling me how, you know, the Bible is still fresh, still new. It was a great conversation. And he goes, well, this morning I was reading in my Bible, and I happened to be reading Psalm 139. And just a great passage. And it was like, at that moment, I, I knew that it was God's way of, of confirming and circling that this is where we should be on a great morning like this. So that's where we're going to be this morning. We're going to be in Psalm 139. And if you are able, please stand with me. And it is 24 verses. I had thought about, do I read a few? But after last week, I think it's proof that you guys can stand for a lengthy period of time. <laughs> so without further ado, let me read Psalm 139. It says, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise, you discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O oh Lord, you know it all together. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, and the light about me be night, 
Even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written, every one of them, the days that were found, formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. If I would count them, they are more than the sand. I awake and I am still with you. Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O God. O men of blood, depart from me. They speak against you with malicious intent. Your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with complete hatred. I count them my enemies. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there are any grievous way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. Let me pray. Dear Lord, just thank you. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for being the God of worship, the God that desires and deserves our worship. I thank you for this passage of scripture that we're able to read this morning that just shows how much you value us. And as we see how much you value us, hopefully it inspires and encourages and convicts our hearts to value our own lives, but also those of the lives around us. And so I, I pray as we, as we look at these scriptures, these verses, that you would just renew our hearts to where they need to be renewed, change our hearts to where they need to be changed. And I pray for those that need to hear what you have for them, that you would just open their hearts and their minds and their ears for what you have for them. And I thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. So as we look at this passage, and I think the beauty of it is that it does show and it does express a value that God has on all life, on all life. And so I, I hopefully the main point that we can gather from this passage as we look at it and we, and we study it is God values my life from beginning to eternity. God values my life from beginning to eternity. And I think we can see that and we can say that based off what we've seen of God and from God. We know John 3.16 Verses, and also verse 17, I think, confirm and really show the value that God has for us. Verse 16, most people in the room probably know. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Is it pretty clear, hopefully, as I read, just, you know, like I said, John 3, 16, most everybody, churched or unchurched, a lot of people know that scripture, for God so loved the world. And he expressed that by sending his only son so that we could believe in him and have eternal life. I think it shows very clear that God ex values our lives from the beginning to even eternity. And even as we will look at God knowing us, God present with us, even the idea that he doesn't, you know, his objective isn't to condemn us, but to save us, to give us a better life, especially for our eternity. Another popular passage, Romans 5, I'm going to read 6 through 9, verse 8, you'll probably recognize, says, verse 6 says, for while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 
Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, more, more, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. And so I would, I would say once again, and there's probably many scriptures that just point to the value that God places on us. He values us. He, he desires us. And I think that's important. That's important as we, especially as we look at the scripture and we see and we understand a God that values us, that loves us. And we can see this in throughout aspects of the scripture. But it's really, hopefully, I'm going to ask a question after most of my points, if not all my points, is the real question is, do you believe these things? Do you believe these things? Because that's the important part. The important part is that we walk out with belief in the truth of what God's word says, especially about him and the value that he places on life. And I will tell you, I will say, your belief in it doesn't change the truth of what it says and what it means. And that's important. But it's important that we come to those conclusions of who God is as we look at our own lives and what we are here for. Warren Worsby writes, when we think about God and our relationship to him, relationship to him determines what we think about everything else that makes up our busy world. Other people, the universe, God's word, God's will, sin, faith, and obedience, wrong ideas about God will ultimately lead to wrong ideas about who we are and what we should do. And this leads to a wrong life on the wrong path toward the wrong destiny. In other words, theology, the right knowledge of God, is essential to fulfilled life in this world. So let's look at this passage of scripture and break it down and see what God thinks of us and what that looks like. The first six verses, we're gonna, we're gonna look at those first. Once again, it says, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O, o Lord, you know it all together. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. So what do you see here in these first six verses? What do we see here? What we see is a God that knows us, that understands us, Speaks to his omniscience, his, his understanding and knowledge and, and knowing. Of, and so my first point is he knows everything. He knows everything. And based off the fact he knows everything, it's basically as we look at this scripture, you could probably write in about me. He knows everything about me. Everything. From the moment you were born, moment inside your mother's womb, till he knows what your tomorrow is going to look like. He knows everything about you, the things that no one else may know, the things you try to keep hidden, the things you try to keep secret. He knows all of those things. And what an amazing truth to understand and believe. But that's why I would ask, as we look at this truth of God knowing you, do you believe that? Do you believe that he knows everything about you? And do you trust in that? There are other scriptures that point to this idea and truth of God knowing us. Second Kings 19.27 says, But I know you're sitting down, and you're going out and coming in, and you're raging against me. It was all these things. Psalm 44, 20 through 21. If we had forgotten the name of our God or spread out our hands to a foreign God, would not God discover this? For he knows the secrets of the heart. And then, of course, Jesus comes on the scene. And if you know, the Pharisees and all, all the, the, the scribes would try to come and test him. And they would try to dupe him into their little test. And, but we see how God, in Jesus, knew everything. And he expresses that. Matthew 9, 4 says, but Jesus, what? Knowing their thoughts. said, why do you think evil in your hearts? Even those moments they thought they were, we're going to get him. We got him. We're going we're gonna to mess with his thinking, his theology, his, the way he thinks. 
But he knew what their true intent was. He knew what their thoughts were. And they couldn't get anything over him. Hebrews 4.13 also expresses this. It says, And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. This is a God that knows us. He knows everything about us. And this is important. This is important as we understand and we, we embrace and we trust in God. You know, we don't have to hide anything from him. Even if we tried, we couldn't anyways. But he knows what we can and can't do. He knows our abilities. He knows our gifts. As I was thinking of this, this idea of knowledge, I couldn't help but think of Moses. You know, Moses, you know, God comes to him. He wants Moses to, to save his people. He wants to, him to go before Pharaoh. And, and, and Moses, thinking he's got it up on God, he's like, well, I'll just tell him that I... I can't speak. I'm not very good at it. So we see in Exodus 4, verses 10 through 12, it says, But Moses said to the Lord, O Lord, my, my, oh my Lord, I am not eloquent, either in the past or since you have spoken to your servant. But I am slow of speech and of tongue. And I wonder as he was saying this, I wonder if he was like, maybe God doesn't know this. Maybe God doesn't know that I can't speak. Maybe he knows that I, I stutter. I'm, I, I, don't, I don't know how to, maybe he's like, well, I'll tell God this. And he'll be like, oh, I'll be off the hook. Yes. God will be like, oh, I didn't know that, Moses. But here's God's response. God says, then the Lord said to him, who has made man's mouth? Who makes him mute or deaf or seen or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now, therefore, go, and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you shall speak. He's like, I, I already know this, Moses. I already know what you can't do. Because you're, and that's great because you're going to have to rely on me anyways. And I think that's the big picture and the piece that we need to understand. That as we understand of who we are and God knowing that, it just should hopefully show how much we need to trust in him and rely on him and that we can't do anything without him. He gave us the ability to stutter just as much to speak. And Skip Heitzig writes, God indeed knows it all. By his very nature, having, without having to learn anything, he already knows everything, past, present, and future. Faced with that, what else can we do but bow to him in worship and adoration. This should draw our hearts to worship a God who knows. A God who, when we think of this idea of knowing, I mean, a lot of times things we know, why do we know things? We were probably taught it. We saw somebody doing it. We watched a video on YouTube on how to do something. I mean, we had to learn how to do that. God didn't have to learn these things. He didn't have to, you know, go figure it out. Like, you know, he didn't have to do that. He knew it because he is God. Charles Spurgeon writes, David says, you have put a ring around me, both in my staying, my staying and my going. I go to sleep, but you do not sleep. I cannot think of you while I slumber, but you think of me. A lot of times we like to, we, th we think of God because we look at ourselves and we think of what we know, we don't know. We, we think of what our abilities are. Uh, just like the idea of sleeping and like this must be somewhat of what God's like or who he is. But he's so far beyond that. He's so far beyond that. He doesn't have to sleep. He doesn't have to slumber. You know, he doesn't have to do those things. While I have to get rest and I have to recuperate and really shut my brain down so that I can stop thinking, he's always thinking and constantly of everyone in this room, which is even more amazing. As you know, we're just, I'm just thinking about myself, the amazement of what he can do, this room and then all of the world and everyone else. And so this should, like I said, should grow our worship, grow our trust in him, and grow our need to come before him. Jane Vernon McGee writes, he is the greatest psychiatrist. Think about that. Think about this. When you have a problem, it is not necessary to climb upon the psychiatrist's couch and tell him everything. Why don't you climb upon the couch of the Lord Jesus and tell him because he knows 
all about you anyways. The psychiatrist still won't know you even after you've told him everything you can think of. And I mean, I, I'm sure he's not speaking against, you know, the opportunity and, and the, the, to go and speak to someone and, and to, to have those people in our lives. But how often do we turn to, the, to people and to things when we could just turn to God who knows us anyways? And we can't hide things from him. He, and we could be honest. And, and, and that's the beauty of it. The beauty of, of, of him knowing us. And then you think of the value that he placed on us. Is that he knows. I know myself. I wouldn't probably sacrifice myself or my children for myself. Knowing who I am and the things that I do and the things I've done. But he knows us and still sent his son to die for us. It didn't stop him from doing those things. I mean, he knew Israel. He knew what Israel was going to do after he released them from Egypt. And yet, he still went on their behalf. And that's just amazing that a God who knows us also loves us. A God who knows everyone is, loves you. He loves you because regardless of what he already knows. And so we need to look past sometimes the things that we know and don't use that as a, oh, God must not love me or God, you know, doesn't want me. That's far from the truth. So what a great truth. And that's why I say, do you believe this? Do you believe that God knows you and that in that God loves you? Because it's to change your relationship with him as you understand your relationship that you can and should have with him. Let's look at this next section of scripture. Psalm 139, verses 7 through 12. Where shall I go from your spirit? Where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, and the light about, my, and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day, for darkness is his light with you. There's nowhere we can go where God is not there. And David is really showing this. I don't know, some commentaries would say, well, this isn't David saying he's trying to hide from God. I'm not sure whether he was just trying to hide from God and he figured, you know, he couldn't get away from him and that's what inspired and encouraged him to, to write this. But either way, he understood that he couldn't get away from God no matter where he was and, and, or when he was. And so we, we need to see he is present everywhere. He is present everywhere. And the beauty of this passage, the way he writes it, is he writes, if I ascend to heaven, you are there. Now, that seems obvious, right? He's God. Of course he's in heaven, Right? He states the obvious first. But then he goes, if I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. And this Hebrew word Sheol is used here, which refers to the realm of the dead, the underworld. The, you know, and so, you know, even below, even, you know, down to the, to the uttermost, where you may not think, well, God certainly isn't there. No, he's still there as well. And this is important for us to, to remember. And that's why I would say, do you believe this? Do you believe he's present everywhere? It should change the way you live and how you see God if you remember and you believe that he is present everywhere. I couldn't help but think of jo Joseph. Joseph from the Old Testament, Genesis. If you remember... Joseph was sold into slavery by his brothers. You would think, man, he's at the lowest point, right? He had his family pretty, doing pretty well. But then he's sold into slavery. He's off on his own, by himself, away from his family. God's certainly not here. God's certainly not there, right? But you can tell from the way Joseph lived, even in that place, that he knew God was still there. And that God was still watching over him. 
even at the lowest point, you would think. And you see some aspects of this as we look at Genesis 39, 2 through 4. It says right from the very beginning, the Lord was with Joseph. And he became a successful man and he was in the house of his of his Egyptian master. His master saw the Lord was with him and that the Lord caused all that he did to succeed in his hands. So Joseph found favor in his sight and attended him. And he made him overseer of his house and put him in charge of all that he had. He worked in a way, he lived in a way that he understood that God was still there, still present, still watching him, still guiding him. He didn't throw out the principles of God. He didn't, he didn't throw out the presence of God because he was in a place that just didn't seem like God was there. And so the way he worked showed that. But then you could also see from Joseph's own words. As if you know, Potiphar's wife was trying to make advances on him. And, and you know, I don't know how hard or easy that, those temptations might have been. But the one thing that really caused Joseph to resist those temptations was he understood that God was with him. And so he had to live a different way. It says in verse 8, Genesis 39, it says, But he refused and said to his master's wife, Behold, because of me, my master has no concern about anything in, this, in the house, and he's put everything that he has in my charge. He's not greater in this house than I am, nor has he kept back anything from me except you, because you are his wife. How can I do this? great wickedness, and sin against God. He understood that God was watching him and he was present there and that he had to make decisions because of what he knew God would see and do and being present in his life. And he lived in such a way. And so he believed God was present and it changed him and it made him choose to live differently. I couldn't help but think of Jonah as well. Especially as, as you see, you know, this verse says in verse 9 of 139, it says, And dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea. If you know, Jonah was told to go to Nineveh. He said, well, I'm going in the opposite direction. And if you know, where did Jonah end up? He ended up in the belly of a fish, under, in the midst of the sea, right? And the beautiful thing is, Jonah's, I don't know how many, how many hours or whatever before he decided to get on his knees, but that's what he did. He understood that even in the belly of that fish, in the bottom of the sea, that God was still there. And even though Jonah had been running from God, like, man, I have no business praying to God. I have no business coming to him. Why would he listen to me? I've done, I'm in this place, I'm in this bad situation Jonah 2.1 says, Then Jonah prayed to the Lord, his God, from the belly of the fish, saying, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. Jonah understood that God was still present, even in the belly of that fish. Even though he was in a horrible circumstance, maybe even worse than Joseph's circumstance. But he understood that God was present. And he was just, a, like, I guess you could say a phone call, a prayer away, right? And I know we go through a lot of things in life, a lot of trials. And I don't know where a lot of people are. There's, you know, people in here might be broken families, broken relationships, jobs, different situations that you're just going through, health concerns. But I'm here to tell you that in the midst of the downest point you might be, God is still there. He is still available. You cannot outrun him. And you're not that far to get on your knees and and call out to him, and he will answer. That's the beauty of Hebrews 4. We already looked at it as far as God knowing us. Verses 15 through 16. I just love these verses. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, Yet without sin. What's our response? Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. God is there in our times of need. and He's there all the time. We cannot outrun him. and We're not that far to come to him. And I ask again, do you believe this? 
Do you believe he's present everywhere? Let's keep going. Verses 13 through 18 says, For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you. When I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them. In the, day, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. If I would count them, they are more than the sand. I awake and I am still with you. And here we see where the value of life really starts. From the very beginning, in the womb, it's in here, it's written. He formed my inner parts in, and you knitted me together in my mother's womb. So what we see is he knitted me together. He knitted me together. He created me. He formed me from the very beginning. He formed what I, what I look like today as I've aged. He has formed me and molded me. And the beauty of, of this passage of Scripture as we look at this, this idea of, of God knitting us and putting us together, especially in the mother's womb, is we see this also in Jeremiah 1, 4 through 5. Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. So here we, we are reminded of, of him forming us in the womb. And the beauty of that is we can go back to him knowing us. And that part of him forming us is he knows our today. He knows our tomorrow. He knows what our purpose is. He knows why we're here. He knows all of these things because he created us. He knows what we're about. And I hope we understand that. And once again, do we believe that? Do we believe that he knitted me together, that he formed me and had a purpose? And we can go back to that and believe that. The beauty, I think, of Jesus' birth shows us this. There's the story that was recorded in Luke chapter 2. In verses 39, it says, In those days, Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country to a town in Judah. And she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. Why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. If you didn't notice, Jesus and John at this point are not outside the womb. They are in the womb. And you see them. Worshiping, you see John specifically worshiping and praising God inside Elizabeth's womb. And she could feel it. She knew it. it is, you know, she wasn't, I believe, making this up. And we, we, those that have, have been pregnant or been around, you know, you've seen, you know, babies move around, jump, move, and you know, do those things. And then we also, obviously today we have ultrasounds that can capture some of these things. And see the life that is being formed, the life that is being lived even within the womb. Something to think about as I was studying this passage of scripture, specifically even Luke chapter 2. I don't don't know the name of the author, uh, Thabiti and uh, Abweil. Exalting Jesus in Luke is where it's written. And if you have a chance to read any commentary, look up Exalting Jesus in in whatever book of the Bible. It's a great series of of books to read through. But he had this to say. Had Mary and Elizabeth lived under Roe vs. Wade, the plan of God to save the world would have been in jeopardy. From the angel's announcement to her, she would have had a line of people ready to tell her to abort the baby. We think our age is more advanced and scientific. Well, 
These primitive people recognize from the start something our culture works hard to deny. The fetus is a baby. If it's a baby when you miscarry, it's a baby when you abort. Praise God Christ was not born in modern day America. Praise God for pregnancy. Praise God our Savior was born. And that's, that's the beauty of believing this idea of God knitted, not idea, this truth that God knit us together. Even from the point of Jesus and even John, who John had the purpose of declaring Jesus and who he was. And I could imagine they could have came up with many excuses, especially Mary, especially Mary, unwed, virgin. I mean, it wouldn't have just been easier to just be done with it. But she went through it and carried through it. And because of that, Jesus was born and lived on this earth and ultimately died for us. And so it just shows the beauty of purpose. You know, like we talked about John, even his purpose and being born to, to fulfill that. And that's why God thinks us we're valuable from the very beginning. He created us. He created us. And that's why you're valuable. And that's why he wants us to live and live with him forever. Because we are his. He wants us to be his. Like 2 Peter 3.9 says, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. God wants life. He's given us life. He wants life for us from the, till the very end. And the beauty of this is you think of Peter, the man who wrote this. I mean, the value that God placed on his life. The beauty, you know, if you know Peter, who spent a lot of the Gospels being a bumbling fool half the time, if not maybe even 90% of the time, but especially when he denied Christ three times. And then you have this picture where Jesus comes to him after he's resurrected and this great conversation where Jesus asks him, you know, if Peter loved him. And, and, you, and you see this interaction of Jesus really confirming that, that Pete, what Peter needed to do. And you see a completely different person in the book of Acts. And then you see him writing this because I think he understood that God valued life and wants us to live and not perish. He wants what's best for us. Charles Spurgeon writes, Oh, how important this makes us poor creatures when we remember that God thinks of us. People are proud if a king has merely looked at them, but we can rejoice that God, before whom kings are as grasshoppers, actually think of us and think of us often. One or two thoughts would not suffice for our many needs. If he only thought of us now and then, what would we do in the meantime? But he thinks of us constantly. He says he has engraved our names on the palms of his hands as to show how continually we are before him. This God who created us also thinks of us, and that's, that's important. It's amazing to think about. You know, we put a lot of stock in the people that think about us. I can't help but, you know, two Thanksgivings ago, me and my family were at Disney, Disney World in, in Florida, and one of the rides, my wife, oh, that, that's the guy from Arrow. If you know, so I, I recognize him, and so I shook his hand, I sh- you know, and then I just said, you know, hey, how you doing? And I think he just walked off. I think he was with his son. I can't remember. But I'm gonna tell you right now, I can tell that story how I met him. But I'm pretty sure he's not telling the story. Yeah, I, this guy Dustin Gidry, I met him at Disney World. I shook his hand. You know, he's not telling that story. He doesn't care. I mean, maybe I don't know. I didn't give him my names, but. But we have the God of the universe who thinks, who's created us, thinks of us, knows us. He cares about us. We're special to him. And that should mean something to us, especially as we think of this, this idea of how valuable we, we think of people thinking of us. Let, let's uh, finish. And 19 through 22 says, Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O oh God, O oh, men of blood. Depart from me. They speak against you with malicious intent. Your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate those who hate you, O oh Lord? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with complete hatred. I count them my enemies. This was 
one of the verses that I was really like, I don't know if I want to, this one seems really confusing, doesn't seem to maybe go with the, the theme of God value in life, but I had some great good conversations, and I think we can end. Well, point number four, he gives me hatred of sin. He gives me hatred of sin. You see this, this attitude from David that, that he does not tolerate those that hate God, who want nothing to do with God. And as we become God's children, this should be our heart. This should be, you know, as we understand, you know, what it looks like with sin and what it does to God and what it did to his son on the cross. It should give us that, that hatred, which is where we should be, you know. As we look at this, this, this prayer that David offers, it seems, you know, mean and conniving. And, and I think it's a conversation to God, so that's between him and God, these conversations. Because as you think about it, Jesus does say, love your enemies and pray for those who harm you, right? But in almost the next, we also see from last week, Luke 14, 26, Jesus also says, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Did Jesus forget that he just said, love your enemies in those? And, and, you know, but now here he's talking about hate, right? I think he's talking about and he's referencing, you know, the things that we're about. The, The love we have for God should trump, you know, when those those people and wickedness and and sin we should you know i've heard the definition of fearing god the best definition i've ever heard is to love the things that god loves and hate the things that god hates and that's what god wants for us god wants us to change our hearts from from a hatred of the things of this world or the hatred of sin or or the love of those things he wants to change it to the hatred and he he puts these things on our hearts we just need to um romans 1 says in verses 18, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Suppress the truth. God has given them this, this truth of who he is and what he's about. And it's our suppression of that, that he is trying to draw us uh, you know, away from that suppression. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world. And the things that have been made, so they are without his excuse. God wants to change our hearts from away from the things of the world and sin to the things that he is about. And this will change our lives forever. And that's what he wants. He's not just, I don't want them to have no fun. I'm taking away their joy, you know. But he wants better for us. Later on in Romans 12, verses 9, he says, Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Why? So we can hold fast to what is good. Verse 21, Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. God wants us to draw away from sin so that we can be drawn toward what is good, which is holy, which is him. Once again, I ask, do you believe this? Do you believe that God wants you to have hatred of sin? Do do you believe that? So let let me close. Let me review these things. First, we saw that God values me from beginning to, to eternity. From the very start, from the very end, and we saw that, and we see that by him sending his son so we can have eternal life. We also see that God knows everything. And if you want, God knows everything about me. We also see God is present everywhere. He is everywhere I am at, and I, I'm not too far away from him. God knitted me together. He created me from the very beginnings. He knows me. And then God gives me hatred of sin. And like I said, do you believe this? Because this should come down to the the, um, closing, the last two verses. And they say, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there are any grievous way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. Like I said, 
Do you believe those things? Because this is where it comes down to. God values me, so I should value him. God values me, so I should value him. When we start really believing who God is and what he thinks of me and what he's done for me, it should change our hearts and our minds to what we think of him. John 14, 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Our value of him changes our decisions, changes the way we obey him. Let me close by talking about a man named Saul, not the man from the Old Testament, but the New Testament, who we will know later on. If you know, this man is on the road to Damascus. Not a good guy, trying to kill Christians. That's what he's doing. Verse 5 says, and he said, this is Jesus, who are you, or this is Paul, or Saul, who are you, Lord? And he said, this is Jesus, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. He knew what Paul was up to. He knew what he was about to go do. And I love that Jesus still stopped him on that road. He still said, I want that guy. Like I said, Paul wasn't a great guy. Most people would have. You know, even the Christians had a hard time accepting him even afterwards because, he, you know, he was not a great guy. But Jesus, even though he knew that, still called him and moved him. Paul didn't stay there, and that's the beauty of this, this, this story in this picture. Verse 16, for I will show him, this is Jesus talking, or God talking to Ananias, or um, the prophet. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. Speaking of Paul, we talked about suffering. We talked about counting the cost last week, right? Paul knew from the very beginning that he was going to suffer and he was going to have the cost that he needed to count. God did not hide that from him. And so Paul had a choice. He could have just been like, yeah, I'm, I'm saved. I'm good to go. I'll go back to my life. Maybe not killing Christians, but, you know, I'll do whatever. Or I can go and be a vessel for God and go and minister to those around me. And so as we, we see verse 17, so Ananias departed and entered the house, and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you came, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales from, fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized, and taking food, he was strengthened. For some days, he was with the disciples at Damascus. And once again, he still had a choice to make, what he was going to do with this, this truth, this information. Did he really believe what God had revealed to him, opened his eyes to? And we see as we start Paul, see Paul's journey starting here. And immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue, saying he is the son of God. He believed what he had seen on that road. And he was not ashamed to tell others. And all who heard him were amazed and said, is not this the man who made havoc in Jerusalem of those who called upon his, this name? And has he not come here for this purpose to bring them bound before the chief priest? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. Let me close with Romans 10, 9. It says, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That was Paul's message and mission from the moment he was seen, or called on the road to Damascus. I don't know where you're at this morning. I don't know where you're at this morning. Some of you may feel that call just like Paul on the road. Some of you may have made that decision. Confess Jesus is Lord. That changes the value of who God is when you make that statement and you make that belief statement. I pray that we don't all stay on the road. There's a lot of people that like to just stay on the road to Damascus and never venture off and go past that and go do what God has called them to do. And it really comes down to the value you have on God. Jesus is Lord. And I pray 
that we would search our hearts and see what that means. Because God values you enough to give you the opportunity to make that confession of faith. Make that confession of belief. And what will you do with that? Let me pray.